Thank you for joining us for today's online talk, which will be starting shortly at 11 a.m. For those of you who are here early, thank you for waiting patiently. While you're waiting, we would like to share with you a short video from the firm. I founded the firm in September 1985 with the vision of seeking truth and justice for our clients and not just winning their cases. Over the years, the team has achieved many significant milestones. We are today recognized by the Legal 500, Asia Law Profiles, and Asian Legal Business as a recommended firm in various practice areas. While we have embraced technology to make our services efficient and responsive, we continue to grow on a bedrock of meticulous preparation and hard work, for which there is really no substitute. As legal practice becomes increasingly international, we keep ourselves ahead of the curve with our relationship with lawyers from around the world. Our firm is a founding member of the Legal Lawyers, a growing international network of law firms in 20 Asian and European countries. We believe in partnering with our clients to protect and grow their business. We achieve this by holding firm to our values of integrity and justice, while giving our best to deliver effective and efficient solutions. Instead of just legal services, we focus on developing great working relationships based on understanding and respect. The firm invests in its team and emphasizes professional development. We are keen to share our knowledge and publish our articles on our website. And we also give back with our corporate social responsibility activities. We cultivate a passion for the law and enjoy what we do. This brings out the best in us for our clients today and tomorrow. We regularly advise foreign clients, including many Chinese investors, and have a ready appreciation for different ways of doing business. In corporate matters, we offer relevant and commercial solutions, often raising issues that clients may or may not have realized before. In negotiations, we believe in facilitating win-win outcomes. Hi everyone, welcome again. Thank you for joining us for today's online talk entitled Unfair and Constructive Dismissal Claims Due to Pay Cuts, Voluntary Separation Schemes and Retrenchment. My name is Janessa Sako. I'm an associate with Ma Winko and Associates and I will be a moderator for today's session. Before we start, let me introduce the firm and what we do. Ma Winko and Associates is a mid-sized law firm that was founded in 1985 by our Datuk Ma Winkwai. Our ABLE team today comprises 22 lawyers and a support team of 19. Today, Datuk Ma is a consultant with the firm following his retirement from the Court of Appeal bench in 2015. The firm continues its tradition today of working primarily with small medium enterprises, family businesses, as well as individuals. We are a full service law firm with a corporate department and a dispute resolution department, which includes litigation, adjudication and arbitration. We also have a dedicated employment and industrial relations team, as well as a department focused on servicing the needs of individuals and families. Our practice groups, as you can see in this slide, indicate some of our focus areas, which are supported by talents from both our corporate and dispute resolution teams. Today's talk is part of our MWKA online talks series. By way of background, we have been organizing monthly lunch talks at our office since 2013, some of which were also broadcasted live. However, with the COVID-19 MCO, we have moved online in order to continue our objective of sharing knowledge, raising awareness, and encouraging networking for clients, potential clients, as well as in-house counsels. Today, we will be having our 16th talk in our online talks series, which has been attended by more than 3,000 attendees. Today, we are expecting 197 participants who have registered. Please feel free to visit our website at www.mawengkwai.com for more information or to read our articles. You may also sign up for more upcoming talks on our website. Before I continue, 
please be reminded that this talk does not constitute legal advice. In the event you require any specific legal advice for your matter, please contact us for a complimentary legal consultation. Details regarding the complimentary legal consultation will be given at the end of this talk. We have two speakers for today, Ms. Diana Chak and Mr. John Chan. We will conclude today's session by addressing questions raised on Slido. Allow me to introduce our speakers for today. Our first speaker for today's session will be Ms. Diana Chap. Diana is our senior associate in two departments, namely our dispute resolution and employment departments. She obtained her Bachelor of Laws from University of Malaya and was subsequently admitted to the Malaysian Bar in 2014. Diana is also a certified mediator with the Bar Council Malaysian Mediation Center. Just to briefly share with all of you, apart from advisory and litigation matters pertaining to employment and industrial relations, Diana's areas of practice also include mediation as well as corporate and commercial litigation. Moving on, our second speaker for today is Mr. John Chan. John is also our senior associate in our dispute resolution and employment departments. John obtained his Bachelor of Laws from University Kebangsaan, Malaysia. He was admitted to the Malaysian Bar in 2014, and he is currently an active member of the Bar Council Sports Committee. In addition to employment law, particularly in disputes pertaining to unfair and constructive dismissal, John's areas of practice also include contractual and commercial disputes, debt recovery, strata management disputes, as well as director and shareholders disputes. Our speakers were target to complete their presentation by 11.45 a.m. and they will then proceed to address the questions posted on Slido. If you have any questions, please don't forget to post it up on Slido. You can access the Slido page by scanning the QR code that is available before you or you may search www.slido.com and key in the code 82157. I repeat, 82157. I will leave this slide here for a minute for everyone to scan the QR code. Okay, moving on. Today's interesting top points are as follows. Point number one, overview of unfair dismissal claims under Section 20 of the Industrial Relations Act 1967. Point number two, can voluntary separation schemes and retrenchment amount to unfair dismissal? We will then move on to point number three, what is constructive dismissal? And lastly, can pay cuts and unpaid leave amount to constructive dismissal? Diana will be covering the first two points and John will take over to further discuss the last two bullet points. I will now invite Diana to share her insights. Over to you, Diana. Thank you, Janessa. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for participating in our online talk today. I'm Diana. Um, during the MCO period, we have heard uh, businesses, uh, in fact, many businesses exercise uh, pay cuts, uh, offer voluntary separation scheme, and retrench their employees uh, due to loss of profits and decrease in sales and revenues. Um, today, my colleague, uh, John, and I will be discussing on whether pay cuts, VSS, and retrenchment may give rise to unfair and constructive dismissals. Under Section 20 of the Industrial Relations Act, uh, an uh, Section 20 states that an employee who feels that he or she has been terminated without just cause or, or excuse may file a written representation to the Director General um, to be reinstated in his former employment. The case of Hong Leong Equipment Xuan Berhad. Uh, in this case, the court held that the law provides for security of tenure and the judge equated the right to employment to the right to property. And employers can only dismiss employees with just cause and excuse. Section 20, um, subcapital 1A, of the Industrial Relations Act states that an employee who feels that he or she has been dismissed um, without just cause and excuse may file his or her written representation within 60 days from the date of dismissal. 
we would like to also draw your attention to the Ministry of Human Resources FAQ number no. 3, dated 31st of March 2020, which states that the MCO period will not be taken into account when calculating the 60-day limitation period. I will briefly explain on the procedure from the filing of uh, a written representation at the IRD um, up to the referral of the matter to the industrial court. When an employee feels that he or she has been dismissed without just cause and excuse, the employee may file the representation at the Industrial Relations Department. The Industrial Relations Department will then issue a letter to the parties to attend settlement negotiation at the IRD. During the settlement negotiation, the IRD officer will reconcile differences between the employer and the employee and try to achieve an amicable settlement between parties. If amicable settlement is achieved, the matter ends there. However, if there is no settlement, the IRD will then notify the minister and the minister will refer the representation to the industrial court if he thinks fit. The industrial court proceedings. Usually it takes six to nine months um, for a matter to be disposed of in the industrial court. After the matter is referred to the industrial court, the court will issue a notice of mention of case to the parties. And usually at this stage, parties will appoint solicitors. The court will then direct parties to file form A and B, which are the application to be represented, and the warrant of authority, giving authority to the lawyers to represent the parties in court. The court will then direct the claimant to file his or her statement of case. After that, the, the court will direct the company to file its statement in reply. And lastly, the claimant will file it, his or her rejoinder. The statement of case, statement of in reply, and uh, the rejoinder are called pleadings. And once pleadings are closed, the court will direct parties to file their respective bundle of documents, which will contain um, documents or evidence, documentary evidence, um, and parties will be directed to file their respective witness statements. The court will then fix dates for trial and witnesses will be called to testify during trial. Once trial is completed, parties will be directed to file their respective written submissions. And usually there is no oral submissions in court. The judge will then deliver his award after filing of the written submissions. The whole process takes about six to nine months. If the court is of the view that the dismissal was done without just cause and excuse, the court may award reinstatement of the employee to his former employment, or if reinstatement is not suitable, the court may award compensation in lieu of reinstatement, which is usually calculated at one month's salary for every one year of service. The court is also empowered to award back wages for probationer a maximum of 12 months, and for permanent employee, a maximum of 24 months. Back wages would include bonus, incentive, allowance, and employee's EPF contributions. In the case of Gu Kui Poi, the federal court held that the company bears the burden to prove that the, dismiss the dismissal of the employee was done with just cause and excuse. Moving on, let's explore whether a voluntary separation scheme amount or may give rise to unfair dismissal. What is a voluntary separation scheme or VSS? It is a voluntary and mutually agreed termination of the employment contract between the employer and the employee. Usually, how is this done? The company may inform the employees by way of memo or may hold a town hall meeting where the CEO of the company or the manager of the company will inform the employees that the company intends to offer VSS to all employees. And any employee um, is welcome to submit his or her application for VSS. A VSS generally cannot amount to a dismissal by the employer, as the name suggests, voluntary. And because VSS is entered voluntarily, between the employer and the employee, the issue of fair or unfair dismissal does not arise. The federal court in the case of Zainon Ahmad decided that 
the rights arising upon the termination of an employment contract are extinguished pursuant to a termination through VSS, despite the absence of an express provision to that effect. The court said that VSS is a separate and independent contract intended to mutually override and terminate an existing contract of employment. Under the VSS, the employees have the option to accept the said scheme or continue to work as before. Therefore, once the said option has been exercised by employees, the question of it being unfair does not arise. However, the VSS may amount to unfair dismissal if it was carried out by force, coercion, duress, or influence in any form or by any unfair labor practice. The case in Susila Devi Balakrishnan, an industrial court held that if the VSS was carried out voluntarily, then the claimant's separation from the company was proper and in order. However, if the VSS was applied involuntarily, that is to say it was carried out by use of force, subtle or otherwise, or by coercion or duress in any form or by any unfair labor practice, then it may amount to dismissal without just cause or excuse. Further, in the case of Harper's Trading, Malaysia Stramber Hart Butterworth, the industrial court said that if it is proven that an employer offered the employee the alternatives of resign or be sacked, and without anything more, the employee resigned, that would constitute a dismissal. The principle is said to be one of causation, the causation being the threat of the sack. It is the existence of the threat of being sacked which causes the employee to be willing to resign. The court further states that if willingness is brought about by some other consideration and the actual causation is not so much the sacking but other accepted considerations in the state of mind of the resigning employee, then it has to be said that he resigned voluntarily because it was beneficial for him to do so, then there has therefore been no dismissal. I will discuss two cases example cases on VSS and you may, you may look at the facts and observation uh, of the court in these two cases. The first case, Ng Wei Jie and Kaposki Lab C. Shramberhat. In this case, both company and claimant signed a separation and release agreement. The claimant later filed a representation under Section 20. The company contended that there was no dismissal because the termination had been mutually agreed by both parties under the agreement. The claimant alleged that she was put under tremendous pressure to sign the agreement and she was told that she refused, if she refused to sign the agreement, the company will still terminate her and given an ultimatum, either sign it immediately with some payment or be dismissed without any payment. During trial, the HR officer was called to testify as a witness of the company and she testified that. She explained the draft agreement to the claimant and the claimant was calm, composed and did not react negatively or aggressively during the negotiation. The claimant was very keen to explore on the monetary package and propose to the company for a one month salary as a separation sum. When the company agreed to pay more than what she, the claimant had requested, the claimant proceeded to sign the agreement. The HR officer further testified that the claimant has a strong character and she's a confident person with firm opinions. Hence, there is no way that she could be forced to do anything against her will. The industrial court, upon examining evidence, decided that the claimant had willingly opted to separate mutually with the company and had negotiated with the company for a separation sum. Hence, there is no forced resignation or being coerced into agreeing to the separation, neither she was put under compulsion to resign. The court said that there was no dismissal and the issue of with or without just cause or excuse does not arise. Now we look at the second case. The case of Ahmed Fauzan Aziz. The company and the claimant signed the VSS. The claimants later filed a representation under Section 20. The company contended that the VSS was mutually agreed and the claimants had never complained to the company of any coercion by their superiors. The 11 and the 13 claimants alleged that 
after the company's briefing on the BSS, their head of department called a departmental meeting. At the departmental meeting, the head of department informed them that their names were on the VSS list and they were told to apply for VSS. They were also informed that their department will be closed and all employees will be terminated. They were also told that if they, were, if they did not apply for VSS now, their services in the future will be terminated without payment of any benefits or be paid lower retrenchment benefits. The industrial court decided that the company, by doing all that, had planted the fear of retrenchment in the mind of the claimants. And they were compelled to consider whether they should apply for VSS or just face the prospect of being retrenched in future with lower benefits. The court further stated that the company had made a grave error in informing the claimants that their department will be closed in the near, fu near future. The court opined that this had put the fear of future retrenchment in the mind of the claimants, and as such, their volitional capacity had been impacted. The court further stated that it cannot give effect to the purported VSS in accordance with equity and good conscience. Next, we will look at whether a retrenchment exercise may give rise to unfair dismissal. Last one, my colleague, Janessa and I had given a detailed presentation on retrenchment. You may find the presentation from the link shared in the chat box here. For the purposes of today's talk, I will briefly explain on the general retrenchment principles. In order to carry out a proper retrenchment, there must be genuine redundancy or surplus of labor in the organization. In deciding whether the retrenchment was carried out in good faith, the court will look at whether the company had exercised proper labor practices as follows. First, the court will, will look at whether the company had implemented other cost-cutting measures first. This would include pay cuts, reducing working hours, temporary layoff, freezing of new recruitments, and etc. Section 60N of the Employment Act 1955 states that when the company decides to exercise a retrenchment, foreign workers must be terminated first before the company consider local employees. The retiring employees should also go first and the court will look at whether the company observe the LIFO principle, which is the last in first out principle. But we also look at whether the company retrained or assisted the employee in finding alternative employments. Whether VSS or MSS was offered to the employees before the company decided to go on a retrenchment exercise. The court will also look at whether early and proper notice, consultation, and announcement are given to the employees. Lastly, the court will also look at whether payment of layoff benefits and compensation were offered to the employees. Moving on, we will look at two cases on retrenchment, pay attention on the facts of the case, and the observation that were made uh, by the judges in these two cases. So in the first case, the case of Chai Woon Gyok and Stateland Marketing Schramberhardt. The company retrenched the claimant in view of the company's adverse business activities that has affected its financial position in the marketplace. The company in this case paid retrenchment benefits to the employees. During trial, the company produced documentary evidence including manpower movements records, annual sales reports, annual profit and loss of stock loss statements and also audited accounts. The company was able to show that the company sold off its land and building to pay the company's liabilities. The company had to move to a rented premises. From the year 2004 to 2008, the company reduced its manpower from 74 employees to only 40 employees. From 2004 to 2006, the company experienced deteriorating sales from 32.1 million 
to 11.8 million. In 2004, the company earned profit of 1 million, but later in 2005 and 2006, the company lost 6.2 million and 5.5 million. Upon evaluating the evidence available, the court decided that the company had no alternative but to retrench the claimant together with the others. In these circumstances, the company's financial situation at the material time, the claimant's job functions had diminished. The company was entitled, entitled to retrench the claimant since it is the right of the company to decide how best to run its business. The court also this helped that the company had produced overwhelming evidence to show the financial condition it experienced at the material time and the need to restructure to remain competitive. Now we look at the second case, the case of Siva Balam Anak Lelaki Pubala Singham and Kuwait Finance House Malaysia Berhad. This is a very interesting case. In this case, the company terminated the claimant on the ground that the claimant's position in the company was redundant. The claimant was the only employee who was terminated at a material time. The claimant was paid a sum of money as full and final compensation for the termination of his employment due to redundancy. After the services of the claimant had been terminated, the, the company employed another person to hold the same position the claimant last held in the company. The company submitted that the claimant did not state that the acceptance of the termination was under protest and the claimant was paid a sum of money as full and final compensation for the termination of his employment due to redundancy. In addressing this issue, the court held that even if the claimant has accepted money as full and final settlement, the claimant can still proceed with the claim for wrongful dismissal under Section 20 of the Industrial Relations Act. As the Industrial Court must act according to equity, good conscience, and the substantial merits of the case without regard to technicalities and legal form. Hence, technical rules such as estoppel, waiver, and acquiescence are not to be applied in industrial adjudication. The court made the following findings. As there was no evidence that the company has undergone a reorganization and there was no, and there was no surplus of labor due to the reorganization. There was unrebutted evidence that the claimant's position remained despite the fact that the company has claimed the position was itself redundant. This shows that the claimant's position still existed but was carried out by another person which was then appointed after the claimant was terminated. The court held that the reasons given for the alleged redundancy by the company is without good faith, indubitably unwarranted and was obviously not the real and main reason for the dismissal. In fact, the claim of redundancy was merely a convenient and ingenious means to terminate the claimant. In this case, the court awarded compensation in lieu of reinstatement, which was calculated at two months salary as punitive compensation for each year of completed service. The court further awarded full 24 months back wages to the, to the claimant and the company was ordered to contribute EPF for the back wages. While the court recognized that it is within the company's prerogative to reorganize and restructure its, its uh, businesses um, for business uh, efficacy, this case stresses, stresses on the importance of an employer's duty to act in good faith. If the decision to terminate an employee is carried out without good faith, the company, sorry, the court will not hesitate to order punitive compensation in favor of the employee. I will now pass the floor to my colleague, John. And John will be discussing on constructive dismissal and whether pay cuts amount to constructive dismissal. Over to you, John. Thank you, Diana. And thank you, Janessa, for the introduction earlier. Right. So I will be talking on the issue or the question of what exactly is constructive dismissal. We have heard earlier of uh, Diana explaining on uh, Section 20. So a dismissal is a straightforward termination by the employer. However, Section 20 also includes the situation where an employee feels that he or she has been constructively dismissed by the employer. So constructive dismissal 
does not involve direct termination. There is no direct termination by the employer. It is a situation where the employee is left with no choice but to tender his, his or her resignation due to the employer's actions or conduct on the employee resulting in a fundamental breach of the employment contract. In contrast with a straightforward dismissal where the burden of proof is on the employer, in a constructive dismissal case, the burden will fall on the employee first, meaning to say that the employee must prove the constructive dismissal. If the employee fails in proving the constructive dismissal, then there is no dismissal, but it was a resignation. But if the employee succeeds in proving constructive dismissal, then the burden of proof will then shift to the employer to prove that the dismissal was with just cause and excuse. In the case of Anwar Abdul Rahim, the Court of Appeal held that to succeed in, a, to succeed in proving constructive dismissal, the employee in court must establish firstly that the employer had breached a term of the employment contract or has indicated that, the, that he intends to uh, do something which will breach the employment contract. The breach must be a fundamental breach going to the root of the contract. Thirdly, the employee must leave in, a, in response to that breach and not, not for any other reason. And the employee must not delay in leaving in response to that breach. Further, in the case of Govinda Sami Munusami, the High Court added an additional requirement to prove constructive dismissal, apart from the four that I mentioned just now, which is that the employee must give sufficient notice to the employer to remedy the issue, meaning the employee must complain to the employer that, hey, I don't like what you're doing, please stop doing it or please don't do it. If not, I will leave. And so if the employee does not uh, remedy the issue, then the employee is entitled to terminate the contract and leave the employer. Uh, constructive dismissal cases will also uh, commonly involve elements of victimization and bad faith from the cases that we have uh, seen. And also in the case of Anwar Abdul Rahim, the Court of Appeal decided that the test to be applied when determining whether there was constructive dismissal is the contract test and not the unreasonable test meaning to say that the court will look at the contract specifically, whether there was a breach of contract, and not uh, to look at whether the uh, employer's conduct was unreasonable or not. So here are, sorry. Here are a few examples of uh, constructive dismissal cases that we've seen from case law. They include a reduction of work or responsibilities, demotion, change of job scope, transfer between departments or branches, sexual harassment, victimization due to pregnancy, failure to pay salary, and also failure to pay employees statutory deductions. Now we go on to the um, important issue of whether pay cuts may amount to constructive dismissal. The majority of case law says that no, pay cut does not amount to constructive dismissal if you get consent of the employees and know if the employment contract provides for pay cut situations. And yes, pay cuts amount to constructive dismissal if it was unilaterally imposed. And yes, if it is not provided in the employment contract. In the case of Murugesan Subramaniam, the industrial court held that a unilateral reduction in salary without consent tantamounts to a repudiation of the employment contract. Thus, where an employee was not paid according to the contract, this in itself entitled the employee to treat himself as being constructively dismissed. A unilateral reduction of the employee's monthly salary would amount to a fundamental breach of the contract. In the case of Kumplan SF Power Tech, the industrial court similarly held that the duty to pay an employee his agreed remuneration is a basic obligation under the contract. The employer is not entitled to deduct part of the em em employee's salary for whatever reason, without notification, and also without the claimant's knowledge and agreement that would amount to a serious breach of the contract. In the case of Kajuru Taran Samudra Timor, uh, this case was brought up to the High Court by way of judicial review, and the High Court 
decided that the learned chairman of the industrial court had addressed the correct question of law when she considered that there was no provision in the claimant's contract of employment, which allowed the reduction of salary, even when the applicant, or rather the company here, incurred losses in its business. The industrial court made a finding of fact that there was no provision in the contract and the employee did not consent to the massive reduction of 30% of his salary. To me, or rather to the court, the learned chairman was right to conclude that unilateral reduction of an employee's pay constitute a fundamental and repudiatory breach of their contract of employment. So I also have uh, two cases to share with you all. Please pay attention to the evidence that was produced and how the court decided on the evidence. Firstly, is the case of C. Tiao Hock and Pustaka Delta Plajaran. Here, the company was affected by the 1997 financial crisis. Uh, the company had conducted cost-cutting measures, including staggered salary payments and reduction of salaries. The, one of the employees then filed a claim under constructive dismissal. And in the suit, or in the case, the claimant contended that the company had buried his employment contract and he considered himself as constructively dismissed. So on the issue of whether there was constructive dismissal, the industrial court found that there was a unilateral variation of the employment contract. Uh, although the claimant did not inform the company in writing that he objected to the pay cut, this did not prove that he had consented to the pay cut. Uh, the industrial court also held that the company had breached a fundamental term and therefore the claimant had proved that he was constructively dismissed. The court then said, once the court finds that there was constructive dismissal, the next issue for determination is whether that dismissal was with just cause or excuse. The burden shifts over to the company to prove that the dismissal was fair. So just going back to the evidence, at trial, the company had produced evidence showing that it suffered financial losses three years after 1997. It produced auditor's reports, account receivable summary reports, sales achievement reports, and including a Bank Negara report for 1997. The company also showed its loss carried forward in 2007 in the sum of 848,000. The company's banking facilities were frozen. The company could not even buy paper to print and publish its books and operate its uh, main business. And the company's employees were reduced from 300 in 19, 1997 to only 15 in the year 2000. So although constructive dismissal was proven, which means there was a dismissal. The industrial court then uh, considered the evidence of the company on its financial uh, difficulties. And the company decided, or sorry, the industrial court held that the company had proved that it had suffered financial losses. It had to take cost cutting measures such as the reduction of salaries and staggered payment of salaries, which caused the constructive dismissal. The company had proof on a balance of probabilities that the dismissal of the claimant was, was with just cause and excuse. And so the uh, employee's claim was dismissed. On the second case of Kajuruturan Sabudra Timor, here the, com the company incurred losses of more than 500,000. Uh, then the company decided to reduce salary of four employees from the same division or same department by 30%. Uh, in the case, the company contended that the four employees had, had agreed to the reduction. Only one of the employee claimed for constructive dismissal. And in this case, uh, these were the evidence considered by the industrial court. Uh, the company had called its public accountant to show evidence of the company's losses. However, the company failed to call the other three employee, ex-employees to corroborate that the claimant had agreed to the reduction in pay. The company did not consider a lower rate of reduction by ordering a reduction across the board to all employees. And the court held that this showed that the company's intention was not bona fide, or rather uh, with bad intention. And also that the director of that division was not affected by the pay cut. So considering the evidence, the court held that there was no provision in the claimant's letter of appointment, which allowed the deduction of his salary when the company incurred losses of its business. On judicial review to the High Court, the High Court affirmed the industrial court's decision but more importantly, the High Court uh, explained the real issue at hand, which is whether the reduction of the first respondents, uh, the employee's salary was bona fide. The, court, the High Court held that 
the industrial court had found it as a matter of fact that the reduction was not bona fide and this court has no reason to interfere. And so the High Court affirmed the industrial court's decision and did not uh, overrule it. Right. What, what we would like to also stress or remind everyone is that this industrial court is a court of equity and good conscience. Section 30 of the Industrial Relations Act states that the court shall act according to equity, good conscience, and the substantial merits of the case without regard to technicalities and legal form. So we, we do think that in dealing with issues of pay cuts, VSS and retrenchment, the industrial court should consider the economic crisis and business downturn, and also the unprecedented events such as the COVID-19 pandemic and the NCO affecting everyone. I have uh, again two cases which uh, demonstrate the court's equity and good conscience. I will quickly run through it. Uh, in the first case of Panas Realty, uh, it was again relating to the 1997 financial crisis. Here, the employer offered and the employee had accepted an early retirement package. But after that, the employee filed unfair dismissal claim and alleged that he was forced to sign the early retirement letter because he had previously refused a 25% pay cut by the company. The industrial court went into the merits and decided that the employee had signed the early retirement letter voluntarily and that the employee failed to prove that he was forced to sign the letter. And the industrial court could have stopped there, but uh, it went on to make the following statement on the company's pay cut exercise, which it had done earlier. The court has to take cognizance of the economic situation at the material time. The company had enjoyed economic prosperity and unilaterally offered generous perks, benefits and salary increases to its staff uh, before 1997. But 1997 saw a dramatic change in the economy. Even government servants had agreed to their pay reduction. And so the company in tandem with the financial crisis came up with their, finance, with their survival plan in order to survive the impact. The court does not see any element of mala fide on the part of the company. The company was only adopting a proactive stand to create a win-win situation for the company and the employees. The court also found that the company tried not to retrench the employees by proposing salary deductions in the initial stage. But apparently the situation was not getting better and the company was forced to retrench its staff. In the second case of IRH management, this was in relation to the JE epidemic in, uh, I think, 1999-2000. Uh, it was a trade dispute between the workers' union and the company. Here, the company had failed to pay annual increment provided in the collective agreement. Again, the court went into the merits and decided that, firstly decided that uh, the law states that parties to a collective agreement must strictly comply with the terms of the agreement. However, the court then decided that it is prepared to look at this issue afresh the court should look into the cause of the financial losses suffered by the company. In this case, the outbreak of the JE epidemic was something not within the reasonable foresight of the company. The management of the company is no way to be blamed for losses suffered by the company. So although it, the court uh, stated first that compliance with the agreement is strict, the court then took a fresh approach and said that because of the JE epidemic and the financial crisis, the company cannot be blamed. And those were special circumstances and therefore the, uh, the court allowed the company to defer the increment payments by six months. Just some practical tips before we end the presentation. Firstly, we, we advise that you have a complete and proper filing of all your employment documents for all employees starting from the day of their employment or the offer letter. Uh, also keep a proper record of all letters, emails, notices, memos, even WhatsApp messages uh, between the company and the employee or employees. If you have meetings or consultations, please minute them, whether during the meeting or after. Get your, whoever that attended the meeting to sign on them. If the meeting or discussions were held verbally or through phone calls, you can always confirm in writing later on by email, by a letter. If the employees write to you, or even call you or discuss with you on certain issues, always reply, provide a response and pro provide a clarification to them in writing. Uh, always ensure content consistency. For example, if you have a general notice to all employees that you, are, you will be conducting a pay cut, that's your first document. And on your second document, where it's a letter directly to each employee, 
both letters must be consistent. It mustn't be, it mustn't contain uh, different uh, positions by the company and different decisions by the company. Moving on, as you can see from the, all the cases that we've uh, shown you earlier, financial reports and analysis is important right at the start when you are considering taking uh, all these measures. So once you have those reports, keep them properly to con uh, in consideration of the risk of this uh, unfair and constructive dismissal claim coming in the future. For VSS and uh, all agreements, make sure they are clear and comprehensive. Obtain signatures and acknowledgement of receipt from the employees. Also do consider reviewing your employment contracts and handbook to include clauses which cover pay cuts, VSS and retrenchment situations for the future. And last but not least, always seek legal advice as early as possible. Right, that will be all for me. Thank you. Uh, over to you, Janessa. Thank you, John. Thank you, Diana, for sharing with us. I believe everyone finds the session very informative. We will now move on to the Q&A session. Can an employer retrench employee during MCO period? Um, Diana, do you want to answer this question? Yes, yes. Thank you, Dan. Um, yes, you may retrench staff during the MCO period, but uh, be reminded that uh, you have to file a PK form to the nearest labor office uh, 30 days before you retrench your employees. Um, and uh, because uh, you should uh, also consider other alternative measures before you make a decision to retrench your staffs. So all this uh, may take some time. Um, and uh, as, as long as uh, um, you have taken all the uh, required measures um, and you comply with your 30 days um, period, um, you can, you can. Thank you, Diana. John, do you have anything to add? Uh, no, I think Diana has covered it well. Second question, can a company unilaterally impose a pay cut of their employees? John, do you want to try this? Yes, thanks, Janessa. But as, as explained earlier, and uh, the general principle is always get your employees consent if you want to impose a pay cut. But unfortunately, if some or all of them do not want to give their consent, then again, based on the cases, yes, you can, but you have to show good faith right from the start. You have to give warning, general consultation, a proper research of your business projections, your income statements. All this must be prepared to justify the uh, unilateral pay cut uh, for the, if it goes to court later on. I see. So in other words, there will be requirements to satisfy and uh, other requirements to observe before unilaterally imposing a pay cut. Am I right? Yes. It will be the same for VSS and also retrenchment. The company must show good faith, uh, good preparation and good decision making right at the start. Thank you, John. Thank you. What if employee has consented to a voluntary pay cut, but consent was only obtained because it was implied that otherwise would result in being asked to leave. Uh, Diana? Okay. Um, in, in such a situation, um, the, if later, uh, let's say if uh, the company um, exercise pay cut after um, obtaining consent um, from the employee, um, but the consent um, was uh, obtained due to coercion or duress, it may give rise to a possible constructive dismissal claim by the employee later. Um, yeah, so uh, as, as what John has uh, presented earlier, um, hence it is uh, advisable to um, speak to your employee, um, communicate with your employee, uh, obtain consent, but not to threaten your employee um, in a way to say that um, if, you, if you don't agree to a pay cut now, I have no choice but to retrench you la later. Uh, this should not be done. But uh, speak to your employee, um, be transparent, tell them that um, the, the, the company is facing um, financial difficulties right now and the, the company um, wants to 
um, keep all their employees. So, so again, um, good faith uh, plays a very important uh, role um, in such a situation. Right, just, just to add on to that, yeah. I think when it comes to the undue influence or the pressure to sign, I, th I think it's okay if you generally warn all your employees that, hey, we are conducting a pay cut, and if not, uh, the company will have no choice to implement a general retrenchment, or rather a retrenchment, but that warning is to all employees. So I, I feel that is okay. But if the company says that, hey, you, uh, employee A, better agree. If you don't agree, then you, employee A, will have to be laid off. Then that one uh, amounts to uh, undue influence or pressure. Thank you, John. Thank you, Diana. Moving on to the next question. Do those who have salary 4000 enjoy any protection? Government not clear? Seems we have no protection against forced unpaid leave until end of May. I think this is a contractual uh, question. Perhaps, John, you want to address this? Uh, unfortunately, whether you are below 2K or above 2K or above 4K, the company, the general principle is that the company has the uh, prerogative to organize its business. So when there is redundancy and when there, when there is financial crisis, the company can uh, implement all these measures. But when it comes to unpaid leave, leave to me, it's a, yes, to me, unpaid leave is the same as a, sal a total salary cut. Dad. So, so the, I, I don't think there is protection. Uh, you have to consider the company's uh, difficulty. I see. Dana, do you have anything to add for that? Mm, no, I think uh, John has covered it. All right. Is, if VSS is not successful, can company proceed with retrenchment exercise? Dana? Um, yes, um, the company may proceed with retrenchment exercise if uh, VSS um, is not successful. Can company force employee to take unpaid leave? John, can you answer this? Thank you. All right, so as uh, mentioned just now, the unpaid leave is the same as the same effect as a total pay cut, which then is a total uh, breach or rather a fundamental breach of the contract. So whether the company can or cannot, yes, the company can, but the company must consider that unpaid leave equals a total salary cut, which is constructive dismissal as we've seen in the cases. So the company has to weigh those uh, considerations. Next question. Can the employer not confirm probationer despite the probationer performed well in his jobs and no breach of any company policy and employment contract? Um, Diana? Mm, okay, this is an interesting question. Um, well, um, if the com it, it all depends on your uh, employment contract and the company's handbook. Um, you may prolong the probationer uh, the probation period by giving the reason that during MCO, um, the company cannot evaluate um, the employee's performance. But it is not advisable to prolong um, the probationer's um, um, probation uh, period um, um, for an indefinite period, yeah, um, um, because uh, the probationer may ask the company, why am I not confirmed um, even though I have performed well and I have not breached uh, any rules and regulations of the company or my employment contract. So if there was a, a, a performance issue, yeah, um, the company will have to um, inform the employee that you did not perform well and uh, give a training and uh, um, 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 Counseling that is uh, that are needed uh, to improve uh, the company's uh, sorry the employee's uh, performance, um, and also take note that if the company wants to dismiss the probationer, um, the company must do so um, with proper uh, sorry with uh, just cause and excuse. The same test would apply to permanent employees. Yeah. 
John, maybe you can share with us what happens if an employee actually breaches the company policy or the employment contract, or whether it is a confirmed staff or a probationer, what happens under those circumstances? Maybe you can share with us a little bit. I think when there is a breach of company policies, it's akin to a misconduct. So I think misconduct would apply equally whether you're probationer or whether you are a confirmed staff. Of course, the general principles say that the confirmed uh, the company's burden is higher or heavier when it comes to confirmed staff. Uh, but yeah, the company must, should also uh, still offer or issue a show cause letter and conduct the disciplinary procedures uh, before uh, deciding to terminate the employee. Okay. So in short, uh, a breach of company policy and employment contract will amount to um, a misconduct. Am I right? Yes. I just I want to add further because the, the question says that can the employer not confirm probationer despite the probationer performing well? So in this situation, if just say the probation is six months and throughout the six months you have the company has expressly told the employee you are doing well, keep it up, uh, and the company has never complained or expressed that the probationer is performing well. And then suddenly after six months, the company then says, sorry, we decide to terminate you because you have failed to meet our expectations. Then there is an inconsistency there. And if the probationer brings an unfair dismissal claim to court, he may succeed because he can show that yeah, the company uh, had told him that he was doing well, did not give any warning to improve his performance, but still uh, terminated him after the six months. Okay. So documentation is important as well, right? and consistency. Thank you, John. Thank you, Diana. Moving on. In view of MCO, if employee is unable to work from home because the work requires him to work at the site, can I opt not to pay his salary since he is not working? John? Yes. Well, to answer this question, again, the general principle is no, you should still continue to pay his salary unless you can prove that the company is facing financial difficulty, zero or almost no income, uh, and so forth. So if the company has that considerations, then yes, it can uh, implement a pay cut. Of, uh, of course, prioritize uh, consent first, but if no consent, then yes, perhaps if the financial situation is serious enough, you can uh, opt for a salary cut, uh, but again, if you're just going on, a, he's not working, so I don't have to pay him, I don't think that is uh, prudent. You should continue to pay your workers if you can afford it. Thank you, John. The next question is, what is the difference between voluntary separation scheme and mutual separation scheme? Um, Diana, maybe you can share with us? Yes, thank you, Jan. Okay, um, the difference between um, um, VSS and MSS is the targeted employee. So in a VSS, um, it is, uh, there is no targeted employee. Um, it is done um, um, in a way where the company um, announce or make uh, or uh, announce by way of a memo or, or have a town hall meeting, um, invite all employees to um, um, to listen to the announcement and say that um, the company is not offering a VSS and any employee is welcome to submit uh, their application for MS, uh, VSS. As opposed to MSS, MSS has a targeted um, um, a group of employees or you may say that uh, the, the company may just target one or two employee, uh, employees um, and offer um, the MSS to uh, this targeted employee um, and uh, the terms and condition um, in the MSS is uh, uh, specially catered for this targeted employee. As opposed to VSS, it, is, uh, um, it, uh, it contains uh, terms and conditions that would be applicable to all employees. Thank you, Diana. Can the company compel the employees to take unpaid leave during MCO? I think John addressed this already earlier, but maybe John, you can just briefly answer in one line. Yes, so if uh, 
Thank you. If the company is just basing on the uh, on the consideration that the employees are not working, so I don't have to pay them, then no general principle says you must continue to pay them. But if the company's financial situation is serious enough uh, with justification that it can implement uh, unpaid leave, which is the same as a total salary cut. Thank you, John. Can the employer not confirm the probationer, notwithstanding that the probationer performed well? I this think this is a repeat question. Yeah, so I think I will skip this question. What is the condition for mutual separation? Uh, I think this question is a little vague. Uh, perhaps, Diana, you can just briefly share two or three examples of the terms and condition in a mutual separation agreement. Um, there is no specific condition for mutual separation um, um, scheme. Um, so the company may target uh, any employee um, and uh, um, go on a mutual separation or, or enter into a mutual separation agreement with the employee. Um, for an example, um, if the um, company wants a specific employee to leave um, due to um, some financial um, reason or due to um, performance uh, reason um, and uh, the company may um, offer um, the uh, targeted employee um, a, a, a sum of a, 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 may offer a mutual separation scheme to this targeted employee and uh, the terms and conditions in the mutual separation uh, um, agreement would depend on the negotiation between the um, employer and the employee. So um, there is no specific terms and condition um, to exercise a mutual separation scheme. So it is up to both parties to negotiate, am I right? Yes. So even if the company does not um, suffer any financial losses, mm -hmm. the company may still offer a mutual separation agreement um, to an employee um, um, based on its own reasons. Lah. Yeah. That's a very good point. Thanks, Diana. The reason was given to the probationer for not confirming is the no bonding with the superior who he reporting to? I think, I think this is a further explanation to the question earlier on probationer. I so, see. Uh, looking at the facts again, so if you have, if the company has uh, never told the probationer that he is performing badly, and then suddenly you uh, tell him that you're not confirming him if you actually tell him that it's because you, are, you don't have a bond with your superior, then that may be unreasonable maybe to the court. But it really depends how you have communicated over the six months with the employee. Um, I think the, the, I would like to add on, I think the um, information given here, no bonding is quite vague. Um, I personally think that um, the reason of no bonding is not a valid reason. Um, to prolong the probation period, um, unless if you, unless if the company can uh, prove that um, no bonding here actually means uh, the employee has actually con uh, committed uh, insubordination, uh, for example, uh, refused to re listen to the superior's um, 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 instructions, and uh, and uh, that would amount to a misconduct. So you can yeah. So you, you will have to deal with that uh, um, in the context of a misconduct. So you will have to follow up uh, with a show cause letter um, and go through the due inquiry. Thank you, Diana and John. Um, due to time constraint, we will take about three to four more questions. Okay. Next question, does company... Okay, uh, is a resignation letter similar to a mutual separation uh, scheme. Mm, Diana? Mm, okay, I would say uh, no, because um, if, a com if, uh, uh, if an employee resigns, um, and uh, the resignation will have to follow the terms and condition of the employee's um, contract of employment, um, that would include uh, servicing the notice period um, so on and so forth. Um, mutual separation is a different thing. 
um, it may happen uh, even uh, um, it may happen where the employee uh, does not intend to resign, but the employer um, offers a mutual separation scheme to the employee uh, on certain reasons. Um, and, um, but there are also mutual separation agreement where the, where, um, the employer actually um, impose a term um, um, to say that the employee is uh, required to um, hand in a resignation letter. Yeah? Um, and if that is um, agreed by the employee, um, it can be done. It can be done because um, some employees may say, um, I want to uh, tender my resignation letter and I want this to be included as a term of my mutual separation agreement to in order for me uh, in, in order uh, for me to um, find job in future yeah it's easier um, for the employee to, to 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 seek for a new job in future if the employee resigns rather than it looks like the employer terminates the employee yeah so in gist a resignation letter is where an employee decides to leave uh, but a mutual separation scheme is where both the employer and the employee agrees to end the employment agreement, correct? Yes, yes, yes. What is the difference between unfair dismissal and constructive dismissal? Uh, John, can you briefly explain? Yep. Well, in brief, uh, unfair dismissal is a case where there was a dismissal by way of termination or the company just asks you to leave on that day. Uh, it's a straightforward termination, whereas a constructive dismissal is, is really up to the employee. If the employee feels that uh, what the employer is doing is a serious breach of the contract, the employee, the employee has to make the decision and consider and then decide to leave immediately. And thereafter, when uh, the employee files the claim in court, the burden is on the employee first to prove that the constructive dismissal was a dismissal, or rather the, the uh, company's actions amount to constructive dismissal. Then the court will shift the burden over to the company to explain why it did what it did and whether it was with just cause and excuse. Whereas in an unfair dismissal, uh, straightforward, the company has the burden to prove why the dismissal was with just cause and excuse. Thank you, John. This is our last question. If company receives subsidy from Perkeso, PSU program can ask employee to take unpaid leave for the first three months and or, or the subsequent three months. Um, John, yeah. do you think about this? Yes. So on this uh, wage subsidy program, the government has said that if you receive, if, if you apply and you receive this subsidy, you cannot, and this subsidy is only for three months, I believe, you cannot, uh, retrench or implement unpaid leave or pay cut on those employees that you have applied for the subsidy for that three months and also the three months after that. So yeah. if, if the employer, although he, uh, despite taking the subsidy, uh, decides to still uh, pay, implement a pay cut or unpaid leave on uh, the respective employees, firstly, I think the company, if it detects that uh, conduct can maybe claim that uh, money back from you, the subsidy back from you. And if those employees feel that what you, you've done is unfair and a breach of the contract, uh, and they file for a constructive dismissal, and if they, then, they, if they then can prove in court that you took the subsidy, it will look even bad on the company, uh, bad faith on the company. Yeah, and to, to, to top up uh, on John's uh, um, answer, um, the subsidy is given by the government to the company to assist the company to pay um, the employee's salaries. So, yeah, so the, the company cannot um, um, ask the employees to take unpaid leave or not pay the company, uh, not pay the employee's salaries after receiving that subsidy from the government. It will um, show um, bad faith on the uh, um, conduct of the company. Thank you, Diana. Thank you, John. We've come to the end of our Q&A session for today. I would like to thank Diana and John for their insights. 
I understand that due to time constraint, there are a number of questions that were posted and not answered. Um, a link to our feedback form will be posted in the chat. Do fill in our feedback form, share your thoughts with us, and you may also ask the questions in the feedback form. Our team will contact you as soon as we can. Before we conclude, I have a few announcements to make. Firstly, we would like to invite you to join our upcoming online talk. On 12th of May 2020, which is next Tuesday, our associates, Mr. Eric To and Ms. Fong Carmen, will be giving a talk on single and joint petitions. You may sign up for the online talk by scanning the QR code, or you may visit our website to register. Secondly, do follow or like our social media accounts and the information will be provided in the chat box as well. Lastly, if you would like to speak to our lawyers, we offer a complimentary 30-minute consultation over the telephone or video conference. We will be providing the link to our website in the chat box. Please fill in the form on our website to arrange for the complimentary consultation. To our guests, thank you for joining us. We hope you have found today's session informative and useful. Thank you, everybody, and we look forward to seeing you in our next talk. Mm -hmm.